Am I on? Oh, yes. It's 110. Sorry, sorry to be starting up a little late. Uh, Board Member Moore will join us shortly, so let's get started. Um, thank you all for coming back. Uh, we're now going to move to the public uh, comment portion of the agenda. If you wish to speak, please fill out one of these blue cards and give it to the clerk as Chris is demonstrating. Thank you for modeling good behavior, Chris. Sorry. All right. Uh, we're going to set it for five minutes. Please try to, thank you for coming back too. So thank you for um, keeping to your five minutes. We don't know how many cards we'll get through the course of the afternoon and generally we found that five minutes is enough to really point our attention somewhere. If you uh, request more, we will consider it, but would prefer five. Okay, first we have Dennis Fox with Fusegate Technology. Oh, hello, Dennis. Mr. Fox. Hello, Madam Chair, members of the uh, board, I'm Dennis Fox. Uh, I was here earlier and right, I talked to you, you about the uh, mindset be about concerning the uh, robber barons <coughs> who uh, in the 1800s and still going on. Mm -hmm. We're at war between those who are program farming oriented and those who are soil farming oriented. And we still going on. And one of the things that's uh, to look at as the, uh, uh, nobody's really looking at it, is the effect of weeds. Uh, the University of California, Dr. Uh, what is his name? Uh, Joe T. Tommaso took one weed, star thistle, uses one million acre feet of water mm -hmm. in the valley. Right. Could be very cost effective. When you get into the mountains and you have all these weeds that are, and the fuel load in the forest, instead of having understory fires, now you're having crown fires. No uh, tree shade, no uh, snowpack storage. Right obviously. Something that they've used at uh, behind Visalia, east of Visalia, at Cahuilla uh, Reservoir, mm -hmm. are fuse gates. And fuse gates are a uh, cast concrete hollow structure that you stack on top of, uh, along the top of a dam. And uh, when they fill, when you, they're going to uh, fill up, and you're going to worry about it topping over, they tip. The water goes inside and the weight changes and they tip. They're called a fuse gate that way. And it's a French thing, it's been all over the world. And that's not too happily approved of by the in house syndrome of the Corps of Engineers, of course, and others. Can you explain how that works again? Huh? How does that work? It's, uh, they're concrete structures. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of, counterweighted, they stick out over. When the water goes in and they fill up, you know, the water comes up to the top, it's going over top, no, it goes in and then they tip. Sounds simple, uh, kind of a basic simple principle. And they're uh, wedged in there. They even have rubber gaskets in between them. And uh, so I thought it was kind of funny. And uh, they're, uh, I think they'd be, uh, they could be done. They could have been done this year. That's what I'm getting at. And uh, what they would help you with is not increased storage. You could fill the reservoir up and then you have the, uh, you can't fill reservoirs because you have to have the flood cushion. Mm -hmm. And this could raise your cushion up so you could have the water oh, fill up the reservoir. You're not going to, the, the, you already have a dam. Right. So fish passage is, not an issue. Mm -hmm. You might have an issue with cultural uh, Native American sites, but I don't think so in these places. Uh, the downside I see is that, uh, that's one possible, is that people will figure in America, hey, we got this magic gizmo. It isn't. And then we won't take care of the weeds and do other things. We've got the magic gizmo. And uh, the other thing is, is think of all the bureaucratic people become unemployed 
And I hate to think of them, you know, going down here on the J Street off ramp and seeing guys in suits with little cardboard signs saying, we'll do studies for food, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't want to see that. But that's, that's the only two downsides, I think. And I think it's something just to be worth considering. Could be cost effective, could be done fast. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, your, your weed point, we can all pick our favorite weed that soaks up water. It's a pretty valid point. Thank you very much. Dante John Namalini, Central Delta Water Agency. Thank you. I'm uh, Dante John Namalini. I'm the manager and co-counsel for the Central Delta Water Agency. Um, I worry about, or my clients also worry about, the abuse of the emergency power in droughts. Unfortunately, it seems like every drought or dry condition, we end up with an emergency uh, uh, implication or order. And what droughts are not, you know, as pointed out previously, are not infrequent in California. We've had six-year droughts a number of times uh, historically. And the planning for the two water projects, the state and the federal project, of course, focused on the 29 through 34, which was six, six dry years or a six-year drought. And uh, the planning, and ag again, I think I, when I spoke to you before, we're willing to try and help work through this crisis. But the reason we're in crisis in major part is because we didn't develop the water as planned by the projects. They were planning to get, the state water project was going to get 5 million acre right. feet a year from development on the north coast. Right. And that was, that fell off the tracks uh, under Governor Reagan right. uh, with his re, uh, order to restudy the Dos Rios project. And it never did get back on track, uh, wild and scenic rivers. And I'm not passing judgment on the merits of those projects, but it leaves us 5 million acre feet short just based on that decision alone. The projects have not operated <laughs> in a manner where they try to meet water quality standards. And the water quality standards, D1641, and uh, none of you were there, <laughs> but many of us spent 82 days of hearing, they have in them uh, critical year criteria. I mean, drought was, was the issue to support the relaxed criteria. Again, I'm not passing on the merits of the fishery criteria or anything else, but the structure of the decision was to carry us through droughts. So there would be no need to change water quality standards, you know, based on the planning and the decision making that was there before. He would apply the criti uh, critical year standards. The problems last year which still give me heartburn on the way the project was operated and I wrote you people letters and I'm going to write you another mm -hmm. one um, indicated that the fishery agencies when they ran in the cold water crisis at Shasta which was with a relatively full reservoir uh, then they came back and said that in order to save cold water in Shasta we want you to release uh, re give us relief on the water quality standards for agriculture in the western and interior delta. They didn't mention one word about exports, not one word. The effect of reducing outflow and exports, you know, they're, they're the same part of the puzzle. In other words, you could have met the outflow requirement had you not exported. So I see the opportunity for foul play here. And you're going to see that in my reactions probably time and time again. And a particular concern to me in the, in the order is 1B, which provides that the limitations, this is the limitation on, on exports and meeting water quality standards, do not apply to transfers under non-SWP or CVP water rights or between SWP and CVP contractors. Then you go to number two, and it says during the effective period of this order, blah, 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 
It says, except that any SWP and CVP exports greater than 1,500 CFS shall be limited to natural or abandoned flow or transfers as specified in condition 1B. So there is a, a hole in this process with regard to water transfers. And what I see is that the projects will use carryover storage, which we need to save to meet the water quality standards, not just in 2015, but what happens if 2015 is dry and we got to go into 2016 or 2017? Somebody's got to brainstorm this a little bit to see what those implications are and what the carryover storage has to be in order to work through it. But what they're telling us here, and I realize you can adjust this, but mm -hmm. they're going to take stored water. What they're talking about is stored water is not subject to curtailment. You, you, your other people are talking about curtailing water rights, except stored water. If the stored water is stored contrary to the permit, in violation, in my opinion, it is not a legal diversion and is not entitled to be treated from a water rights standpoint as stored water. Now what they're talking about doing is they're going to provide stored water to meet, let's say, water rights settlement agreements on the Sacramento River, but then they're going to transfer that water. And that transfer of water is going to be exported, and the exports aren't going to have to meet the standards. Now, I think all we're doing there is giving priority to exports over meeting Delta standards and requirements. And I think that's wrong. So I would be very careful about this provision to make sure that when we're transferring water for export that you're meeting the Delta standards. Now, there may be some variance in it, but it shouldn't be a get out of jail free card, an opportunity for abuse. Now let me make a couple other comments, and then I'll get out of your hair. <laughs> I, I told you. I'd <laughs> Let's do a talk about the Stanislaw River. Mm -hmm. They were putting 2,400 cubic feet per second down the Stanislaw River for fish. No, I'm not against fish, but if you're familiar with the Stanislaw River, 2,400 CFS is a huge amount of water to put down the river. But they put it down with the proviso that it was abandoned at the Delta and exported. Now that looks to me a little bit suspicious that it's really exporting water. If we needed it for fish, wouldn't we kind of look ahead and say that maybe we ought to carry it over? And if you're worried about water quality in the Delta, shouldn't we make sure we've got some of that water for summertime water quality control? So I see that as suspicious, in my opinion, as to why you would do that. Uh, because 2,400, again, is a huge amount for that river. Now, maybe there's other justification for it. And then you heard about these people talking about, and I was kind of amazed that the panel talked as if they never had any experience during a drought. And then I was having a conversation with Francis about our age, and perhaps we've lived too long and these people didn't get the same experience that we had in prior droughts because it was been part of the planning forever. Then somebody said, okay, we're pumping more water at the Tracy pumping plant instead of at the state bank's pumping plant. And the answer was, oh, I don't know why, but there's less salvage. Well, they don't have any decent fish greens at the Tracy pumping plant. It's almost a, a glorified trash rack. So I would ask the question, mm -hmm. is the salvage number that you get out of Tracy affected in any way by the fact you don't have an efficient screen that would capture the fish in which you can then extrapolate to um, a, a salvage or a loss? Mm. So anyway, I think that um, I have no problem with public health and safety. The other thing is I don't know why we've turned this 1,500 cubic feet per second export into an automatic when originally we were talking about health and safety. Health and safety, yes, and, uh, and I state this to you. I'm not going to cause a lot of trouble, but when we start getting into curtailment, we get in a big fight. These issues are going to be right on top of the table in our view as to how fairly the system is being operated 
and what the categories are, the water rights, stored water, and all those things. Anyway, I'd be happy to answer questions. I certainly appreciate you listening to me. Well, it's helpful to look forward to your comments as well. Questions now? For him? All right. Thank you. Thank you. As always. Uh, next, we have Mr. Paul Manazian for the San Joaquin River Must Be Exchange Contractors. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Manassian. I'm an attorney for the exchange contractors. Uh, basically, my diagnosis of this situation and my client's diagnosis of this situation is we can't do much good in arguing the legalities of the urgency order. There are many arguments that portions of the urgency order are not valid, not in accordance with California law but you're looking for something constructive. And you're trying to figure out what is the problem here. Well, I sent you a letter analyzing it in a historical sense, but let's deal with it in terms of human instincts. There's an instinct to be inflexible, and that inflexibility shows up in a lot of different ways. And sometimes it's essential to get rid of that inflexibility. And you've tried to do that by changing your water quality control plan to recognize the circumstances we here we have here. You knew about 75, 76 when that plan was developed. Obviously, you didn't anticipate exactly these conditions. You tried to act flexibly. Here's, here's what I would suggest to you is a better use of your energy so that you avoid a total blow up of the system. Now, I talk about this system very generally. You may value it less than those who have historic water rights and have a priority to water. But I think you do value the system. You see these operators. I mean, they, if they didn't have the system to work with, and I don't mean just the physical facilities, but some idea of priorities, it wouldn't work. And I gave you an analogy of the First World War. I love this analogy, and I'll come back to it later. But why did we have the First World War? Because everybody was inflexible. They started to mobilize. They thought the, the king of England, the king of Germany, were going to show who was boss. And it was, you know, four years later and 50 million people later. And set us back 50 years in society. So here's two areas where you could convene a hearing in a week and you could test whether there's a little bit more flexibility in the system. We, all, we need 200,000 acre feet of water more out of storage exported before September. That solves to some degree the fry problem, it solves the refuge problem, it solves the exchange contractor problem. How do we get there? Well, obviously, risk. We examine the risk to the winter run. Now, I have a feeling that if you had a day hearing and you asked Garvin and the rest of the NIMS advisors, how's this experiment going? Trying to create a winter run habitat in the middle of the valley in a place where the winter run were never reared or spawned before with water to create temperatures that didn't exist. How's it going? In other areas, we build hatcheries for that sort of problem, okay? Well, hatcheries are not natural. I have a feeling you would start to sense some inflexibility there. And the question really is, if 200,000 acre feet of storage is taken out of Shasta, there's no question. There's risk, but it is a dry year. And why are we trying to attract adults in? Why don't we try to get them to over, uh, stay over in the ocean? They're genetically disposed when there are low flows not to come in. Okay, now there's another area of inflexibility that you could evidence by inviting the State Water Project, and the Bureau of Reclamation hydrologists. 
And that's the COA repayment. If you think about it, COA is part of the system. It's the basis of it. You have a BDCP plan, which is based on the COA existing. Just like the First World War, the COA is about to be blown up. It's going to go away. And somebody will, and it's going to have to go away because if the Bureau cannot comply with its legal commitments, then it potentially has to terminate the COA in order to gain again the ability to comply with those requirements. Now, the DWR can go write another environmental impact report for the BDCP, but if we didn't have to blow up that system because the DWR could find a way with part of the 5% to carry over the repayment to a later period when there are more plentiful water conditions, then again, we didn't sacrifice our system because of an imagined need to remain inflexible. So those are the two points that I would suggest you hold a one-day hearing, invite the participants in, and find out if their inflexibility is, is for real reasons or whether there might be a little bit of movement on those two things. And if you get those movements, you preserve the system. You may not love the system like I do, but I tell you, it's all we've got right now. And if we go into another dry year without the system intact, we are going to have total chaos. It's what's kept us together. Thank you. Okay. Any Thank questions? You. I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. A lot to digest. Uh, Patrick Porgens from Porgens and Associates, Planetary Solutionaries. There, I saw you. Hello, Mr. Madam Person. Chairman, Chairperson, and members of the board, uh, Patrick Porgans, Porgans and Associates. People are wondering what a solution this is. I have the solution to the Delta problem, and I brought it before you before, and I'm here to say that I agree with Mr. Mr. Manassian that a hearing is in order. Uh, we've heard a lot from the project operators, and historically, uh, there are there's at least one person on the board that was involved with D1641 and um, has knowledge about what went on here. Um, I have 40 years in water, so I'm inundated and probably waterlogged in the brain. So I want to clarify a number of things. First and foremost, <coughs> there seems to be a pattern to coming into this board by the project operators to request relaxations of the Delta standards. Uh, that was back D1990, D1485, D1641, D so forth and so on. What we've learned looking at the data, and I'm not here to give you my opinion, and I have to apologize in the past when I've come here and I'm you know, a little aggressive. You have to forgive me for that because you know, I get migraine headaches. <coughs> so what I'd like to do is say that <coughs> what we've learned is they empty out the reservoirs in the north and then they push the water down south and then they come back and say we need to get a relaxation. Now we uh, caught them dumping water out of the terminal reservoirs in March. Yes, they were dumping water. The ultimate disposition of that water, you know, from Pyramid to Castaic, into Piru, uh, into the ocean is still under investigation. I'm conducting a forensic account of that. Uh, back in the 1987-92 drought, <coughs> we caught them dumping four billion gallons of water into the, into the ocean. That's all a matter of record. <coughs> I want to clarify a couple of issues with respect to what the state water project was supposed to do and what water it relied on in order for it to meet its four million acre feet. Now, contrary to what a lot of people say here, the North Coast projects were additional facilities. They were not part of the initial project facilities that were authorized under the Burns Porter Act. Uh, under section 12934D of the Water Code. It says here that the operation of the State Water Project <coughs> uh, will Oroville and the Delta um, 
San Luis Reservoir will be operated in conjunction with surplus flows in the Delta to develop the initial firm annual yield for delivering 4 million acre feet of water. This document here is Bulletin 132, 1963. And I, need, I, I suggest you read this because in it, it talks about the delta pooling concept. That concept has to do with the surplus water that would have been available otherwise in the system, which we know now is no longer there. Mm -hmm. Now, it is true that we should have had built additional facilities, but as was mentioned by Mr. Namalini, uh, the facilities weren't built. But again, that wasn't a contingent that was in inclusive in the four million acre feet of water. Now, moving along, uh, I do also agree with Mr. Manassian, uh, excuse me, Mr. Um, Namalini on the 1B, you know, on the surplus uh, and, the, and the, the water transfers. Now, I've looked at the data, and it appears to me that based on the 1,500 cubic feet a second, uh, we've already got about two to 300,000 acre feet of water that's been conserved, and that's a conservative figure. I haven't got to the numbers yet because I'm still looking at them. Now, in addition to that, we had the 5,500 cubic feet a second, you know, for that one week there after the order had initially been uh, approved. We're in the seventh edition of the, uh, the TUCP. And uh, I'm having a difficult time keeping up with, you know, the changes. And I, I can appreciate that you are also having that problem. Um, <clears throat> I'm saying to you that I looked at each one of these droughts, and I've been involved with the droughts as they occurred. In 1976-77, the Department of Water Resources pushed out 600,000 acre feet of surplus water for $2.97 an acre foot, which was delivered from Oroville down into Kern County. I advised them that wasn't a good idea. It was the first year that the project was going to be put to the test. In the 1987-1992 period, I have data that shows that the first four years of the drought, they exported more water in that first four years than any other four years of history. Back in January, when the, the governor and the Department of Water Resources, the project operator, said, you know, this looks like, you know, it could be the worst drought in 500 years, uh, we had data to show that, uh, in fact, the department had already projected that the uh, Sacramento Index, Four River Index, would be at about uh, 6.1 million acre feet. And that would put it third in line to the historical droughts that we've experienced, uh, 24, 31, 77. They didn't tell us that in the data they've given to you. So what I'm, no, you don't have the individual year droughts. So if we look at this last year, and I think that uh, Mrs. Weber brought up, you know, maybe you know, we've had a couple of dry years, and we had a few below normals, and we had a wet year you know, within the last 10 years. And I looked at what was going on in exports. You know, and the exports indicate to me that uh, they were pushing out some water here in 2010, 2011, 2012. You know, then they reduced it to 2013. And that's just a state water project. The Bureau was a little uncooperative with me, and I couldn't file it for you. Uh, I don't have the time. A at any rate, um, what I'm saying to you guys, you know, 2010, they pushed out 244, 2.44 million acre feet. This is t just state water project. In 2011, it was 3.55. In 2012, it was 2.84. And 2013 is 1.95. Now, I've, I've got a handout for you guys today, excuse me, women and men, uh, with respect to questions that need to be answered by the project operators. Remember, when you reduce the or relax the standard, it reduces the amount of carriage water that's required to meet the standard. So by moving the standard from, say, Rio Vista uh, to Edmonton, um, they'll save some water. Now, I have those numbers, you know, and the numbers are there. In terms of, you know, depending upon, and, and this was a good question that was raised by uh, Mrs. Dudek and, Dudek and Mr. Moore. Uh, how reliable, what kind of level of confidence can we put into what is going on with the operational and management decisions that are being brought forth to this board by the operators? Well, historically, you know, if we look at the record, uh, it's less than stellar. Okay, I mean, they make, you know, just like when they jumped on, this could be the worst drought in 500 years. Remember, we were only 16 weeks into the, into the water year. So what they did is they took apples, precipitation, and mixed it with oranges with millions of acre feet of water. See, we were using the index. You know, the index gives us the idea as to what amount of water we're going to have in the basin, the Four River Index in particular. So... Um, and I don't want to take too much of your time, and I do appreciate giving me a few extra minutes, and, but I do believe that we're at a point where the delta pooling concept uh, was based on that idea there was going to be surplus water in the system. Uh, that's been negated. 
Uh, we don't have that any longer, and I believe that's a responsibility of the operators. Now, in terms of how many fish we're losing and whether, in fact, it's like Mr. Nomalini uh, brought up the 2,500 cubic feet a second being pushed out of the reservoir down the valley. Well, when they push 1,500 cubic feet a second out on the pulse flow from uh, Folsom, uh, I have information, and I confirmed this with the uh, Bureau, they can pick that water up later. It's the same thing with the water, uh, the cold water for fish. Now, uh, you know, we spent $500 million uh, <coughs> dollars for water for fish. And I'm saying to you, even the 800,000 acre feet, and if you need the documentation, you know, to support this statement I'm making, I'll provide it to you. They can pick up a lot of that water also. So what we have here is a situation where we're talking about protecting endangered species, when in fact the greatest contributor to the demise of, the, of these species are the project operators, based on the data I have. Okay, so what I'm saying to you is that we need to uh, be flexible, hmm? but we also have to get rid of the inflexibility factor. And they keep coming back here telling you that you know we need to do X because we're in a desperate situation. And I'm suggesting to you the desperate situation is partly brought on by the inflexibility that Mr. Manasti was referring to. So if you give some other people an opportunity, and I'd be glad you know to come here and provide you with the data, and we look at the numbers, and we can come back here and figure out a way we can serve the needs of all the people of California. And at the same time, put ourselves in a better position to uh, negate these impacts that occur as a result of these cyclical processes that, he, that we're become fami familiar with. So anyway, I feel a little better today speaking with you, and I, I want to thank you for your, your attention and your time, and I'll give the hands out to Mrs. Townsend. Please do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Porgan. You're welcome. I think we all, hopefully we all agree we have to get ahead of this curve. Uh, Doug OBG, NRDC. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, I do have a presentation here, and with the chair's indulgence, I would like to run just a little bit longer than five minutes. Okay. Uh, see controller for the slides. Ah, thank you. How'd you get the water thing to do that? <laughs> Modern technology. It's, like it's way above my pay grade. So I just want to start by you know, acknowledging that we are in a really tough situation and all of us are struggling. Farmers, cities, the environment, we're all paying a price. And that's both as a result of natural drought and because of our water rights and uh, water infrastructure system. Uh, the way that we've set up our system, the way California law works, there are winners and losers in our water rights system. Some of us are going to be getting 75 or 100 percent of their supplies. Others get zero. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem equitable. It's uh, but it is certainly much more flexible than some will argue. Um, and we've seen that through both the reasonable use and public trust doctrines as well as other doctrines. That said, a lot of times we focus very much on the near-term impacts of drought, both on people and the environment. And it's important to recognize that drought has long-term consequences. You know, back in the last drought, the 87 to 92, last major drought, that was when Winter to Run were originally listed. They had declined from 60,000 fish returning a couple decades d before to as few as 211 and then a couple hundred, uh, 186 a few years later, back in 95 when they were downgraded. And that was a result not just of drought, but of the way we manage our reservoirs because those upstream temperatures, the blocking habits, their natural habitat, and the cold water refugia that normally exists means that when we mismanage our reservoirs, that exacerbates the effect of drought, and we see huge losses. And we struggle with that today, because that population declining so far affects not just water supply, it affects, affects our ocean fishery, and affects uh, tribal rights as well. I also want to point attention to a, a peer-reviewed research paper uh, written by Monica Winder et al. back in 2011, which highlights that drought doesn't just, it's not just drought, but drought with hydrological manipulation, i.e taking a lot of water out of the system, facilitates invasive species into the Bay Delta. That paper looked exact just at the Bay Delta and found quantitative support for this idea that a lot of the invasions that have occurred have, have been because of the way we've managed our system in the drought. It's not just drought, it's how we manage the system. Let's see here. 
as a couple other speakers have noted, under both Decision 1641 and the biological opinions, we do have provisions in place for critically dry year and drought procedures. And those protections are a lot weaker for our native fish and wildlife in these dry years. For instance, under D1641, we require significantly lower outflow already in the critically dry years. This is an average of the delta outflow prepared by the Sacramento Valley water users back in 2010 and submitted to the board. Obviously, this is an average. This is not what the D1641 requires, but it gives you some sense of the scale involved of just how much less outflow is, is provided for the environment in a critically dry year, the yellow colors, as compared to even a dry year. And those differences really matter. NRDC did not protest the January 31st, 2014 order because it really was balancing the impacts upstream and downstream. It did relax delta outflow requirements, but only insofar as it conserved water upstream. And it made sure that there was this trade-off, that we don't release reservoir, we don't re release water from the reservoirs simply for outflow. And that is a tough trade-off, but we understood it. That said, today, and I really appreciate the project operators today providing that first estimate of the conserved water, some 210,000 acre foot, about a third of which was exports, the rest upstream. You know, that January 31st order had several requirements, including accounting for conserved water, um, as well as providing better detail of how human health and safety needs were being met. And it's really important to keep track of this, and I think some of the other fishery agencies also noted this. We did, however, protest the March 18th order because unlike that earlier order, this one, in our view, had no benefits to upstream reservoir storage. It simply relaxed delta outflow standards, not necessarily in regard to reservoir releases, but to enable increased exports. And that's obviously a policy choice, and, it's, and there are trade-offs involved. But the way that the order was written, it implied or stated that there were benefits to upstream storage. And that's simply not true from that order, as compared to the earlier order that really did already say, if we're not going to be able to meet outflow without, without uh, increasing reservoir X releases, then you don't have to meet outflow. It also, this, this March 18th order, was connected to a waiver of minimum ESA protections for winter run Chinook salmon. And this is the first time that the, project, that the fishery agencies have, to my knowledge, agreed to violate the terms of the biological opinions. And that's a significant impact for, for our clients and our concerns, as well as setting some really dangerous precedents down the road, which I want to talk about briefly. We also protested the April 11th, 2014 order regarding Vernalis flows because it significantly reduced the, river, the inflows down the San Joaquin River, which protect both steelhead and fall run Chinook salmon as well as allowing for increased exports. I mean, one of the ironies of this order is that it not only hurt fish and wildlife, it reduced exports by almost 42,000 acre feet this year. Again, it was connected to a waiver of some of the Endangered Species Act protections for steelhead. And in this order, as well as in virtually all the materials that have been submitted to the board, there's been no analysis of the impacts to fall run Chinook salmon. The focus has been almost exclusively, if not entirely exclusively, on listed species with no analysis of the impacts to the backbone of the state's fishery. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was requested, required by the board's order was to do a water balance. And that's never been provided to our knowledge. And so working with the Bay Institute and others, we did a preliminary water balance. I want to stress that this is preliminary. This is not necessarily set in stone. But of the nearly 4.9 million acre feet of full natural flows, both including the Eight River Index as well as uh, accretions elsewhere, Nearly two-thirds of that was either exported or stored upstream. Um, as you saw from the project operators earlier today, just in three of those reservoirs, Oroville, Folsom, and Shasta, we saw somewhere close to 1.8 million acre feet of additional storage. And when you look at the rest of the system, you can see that there's a huge increase in storage. We exported about 538,000 acre feet during this February 1st to April 15th period. And only one third of the unimpaired flow actually made it through the delta. And of that, about one third of that was simply to maintain export water quality. So you can see that in this drought year, we're already providing very minimal protections for the environment. That said, I, wanna do, I do want to acknowledge that a lot of times it's very difficult to distinguish what protects the environment and what protects water supply. Right. Conserving water and upstream storage protects both fisheries and water supply. Right. The Vernalis flows 
provides both export water supply as well as protecting fisheries. Right. We need more of those kinds of examples. Right. But we also need to improve outflow. As the board is well aware, we've seen a significant decline in outflow. Um, this is from the Delta Stewardship Council. And in this drought year, we're seeing far lower amounts of the natural flow making it through the delta. Just so that I understand that, I'm sorry, I know I should from reading stuff. So, so you're saying of the unimpaired flow, 66% of it, 67 percent of it ended up as storage or export that's correct okay just making sure yep and only one third of it made it through the delta to Sassoon marsh okay. we're going to have impacts this year and some of them will be exacerbated by how we manage the system winter run salmon as you heard very few of them showed up in the rotary screw traps we don't know if we lost them all or if they just evaded the traps but the likelihood is that we'll see very low survival of the the migrants this year and depending upon how we manage Shasta this fall, we could lose, NIMS has warned, as much as losing the entire year class of the fish that will be spawning this year. That's why conserving storage in Shasta is so critically important. For fall run Chinook, it's likely, likely that we'll have very low survival this year. And because they spawn later in the year, we're likely to lose temperature control in Shasta by the time that fall run are spawning. And we've seen significant losses in recent years in terms of red dewatering and temperature um, losses. And who knows which invasive species are going to come in and, and take hold in our estuary as we allow outflow to fall so low, which is really the factor that that paper looked at was the location of X2 and how it affected mm -hmm. invasive species. I think it's also important, you know, from NRDC's perspective, from uh, some of the other groups that we work with, this sets precedents that are very dangerous in our view. As the Bay Delta Conservation Plan is being contemplated, it says that it will, it will result in lower exports in dry and critical years. But as we're relaxing the rules here for environmental protection, what assurance do we have that those rules will actually be followed? And for farmers and cities in the Delta, the board has, lar or the, the executive director, the orders have largely waived any water quality standards for fish and wildlife service, fish and wildlife purposes, and outflow is down to lowest levels that have maybe never been seen before. How do we assure folks that we'll actually be maintaining water quality, not just for fish and wildlife, but for those in Delta uses, particularly folks like the M&I contractors at Contra Costa? And that's, you know, really changed our thinking about the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, made us much more concerned about the potential impacts down the road. You know, a lot of times we focus on the little tiny fish, but it is important to note that protecting salmon, protecting delta smelt, a lot of those protections are nearly identical. They also protect thousands of fishing jobs. And when the state fishery was closed, the state itself estimated losses of thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars in lost income. We know there's going to be losses for lots of different stakeholder groups. But it's clear from at least the written documents that we haven't even considered the impacts to fall run from these changes. And that directly correlates to impacts to the fishery. Finally, we believe that the board should overturn the order on Vernalis flows in April and May to enable both better protection for fish and wildlife for the remainder of the pulse flow period, as well as for water supply for the exporters. We think that this really does, this process highlights the need to update the water quality control plan. We already have critical dry year and dry year provisions. Maybe we need to be more explicit, but it's clear that this process of doing protests and objections does not work effectively for many stakeholders. Many of the protests that were filed back in January, February, March have never been acted upon, and we've had a series of protests or a series of changes that have gone forward. We understand the need for flexibility, but we also need to have a better system to prepare for this and ultimately to have the kinds of plans that we have in place now in terms of the, the drought operations plan. We just think that that balance wasn't struck in the right way, and when we're making decisions in a crisis, it's much harder to make level-headed decisions because you have a lot more political forces. Finally, um, we do encourage the board to follow through on um, adopting a storage requirement for the upstream reservoirs, which was noted in the March 3rd transmittal announcement regarding an order. That's something we need to follow up on to ensure both that we actually do meet these targets and that we protect both water supply for next year as well as fisheries. And ultimately, I think what the drought teaches us is that we really do need to reduce reliance on the delta. 
places like Southern California and Metropolitan that have invested in local storage and have s saved a lot of water are in much better shape than many other parts of the state. As the Delta Stewardship Council and as this board are very aware, we do have a wealth of new water supplies that help us to reduce the conflicts between water supply and the environment. And we need to keep investing in those, like the board's actions to encourage recycled water. We need to do a lot more of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions? Can you elaborate a little bit on uh, the, how, which procedures should we revise? I mean, part of the problem, as I understood it, as the petitions came in and, and, uh, and we had to make decisions, is by the time, because there's a process, but by the time you have made the decision, you're on to, like, there'll be another change and another change. And so uh, that's one reason we're here today is that we've, we need to hear from people. What do we do? I mean, when things are happening so fast that you can't actually have a petition and get it heard and get it acted on before there's yet another, you know, you, you guys have come up with something else that, that's needed. What do we do? How, what do we do? It's a tough call because you want to have a system that is both flexible and yet still has rules. I think part of it is designing the rules up front a little bit better in terms of the water quality standards so that we have to do less deviation from the plan in the first place. I don't think that's true. Um, I think a second step is that it was clear last year that this was a real potential possibility. Mm -hmm. It became clear through the, a pretty dry fall that things were going to be really bad. We should have been having more of this discussion in a transparent way then rather than seeing a series of uh, proposals come through and petitions. Um, I think leading to uh, a drought operations plan was a good step forward so that we didn't just have this seriatim petition without getting that comprehensive review because really what we're talking about is, you know, a lot of different, um, a, every single one of these is going to have impacts and if we don't look at them as a whole, you're going to miss what that total impact is because you're focused on just the narrow thing. Finally, I think part of it comes to resources, that you guys need more resources to be able to respond to the protests and petitions in a timely manner so that we have, so that we don't see all these changes be mooted out by the time the board has time to act on them. You know, the fact that we have protest outstanding from January from some stakeholders that haven't been addressed, that si indicates to me that the process is not working the way it should and that we need to have a more responsive system so that other stakeholders, some of whom who don't necessarily have as much access to some of the agencies, can ha feel like their concerns are being addressed. And I think all of that would go a long way towards reducing the conflict and reducing the uncertainty. Thanks Thank very you. much. Dean Ruiz, South Delta Water Agency. Uh, good afternoon, board members. Dean Ruiz here on behalf of South Delta Water Agency. Uh, my comments uh, kind of relate to what some of the other speakers, in particular the last uh, speaker was addressing with respect to some of your questions as to what you would do. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're critical of the, of the process related to the uh, urgency permit process. Um, I realize you're all in a difficult position and have a difficult job and the health and safety issues are, are real, but there is a due diligence requirement, as I understand it, in connection with the water code section which allows the temporary urgency changes or which addresses that. And the whole process would be, from my perspective, a lot easier to deal with and a lot more productive and uh, a lot more fruitful for everybody if, if you look at it and say, well, if you bring a petition uh, for urgency a couple days before, for in this case on January 29th, a couple days before a January 31st outflow requirement has to be met, if the board at some point would say, by definition, you know, that's not acting in due diligence when we knew we were in a critical situation nine months, ten months ago, mm -hmm. um, that might go a long way in sending a message as to what's urgent and, and what's due diligence, rather, what, what meets the criteria for due diligence. And, and coupled with that, you have, um, you know, you're, you're put in this difficult position. Uh, obviously, there's a petition brought, uh, there's orders uh, granted, and then everything else sort of tears off of that. And then you've got this process that started 
um, without really the ability for any real public involvement or public processes, and you felt compelled, or rightfully, probably under the health and safety concerns to grant it, and then it just, it just sort of goes downhill from there. Um, uh, in relation to this, you also had a, you know, an urgency request January 29th, uh, then it's not until April, I think it's April 11th on the 4th or 5th modification, where then there's a request uh, to um, reduce Vernalis requirements. Well, that's like 70, 72 days later than when this, the January 29th uh, request was made. Clearly, those issues were known to be uh, of high concern, but it sort of got piecemealed, and it probably got piecemealed, depending on your perspective, because that was more beneficial to the, to the petitioner. So in trying to provide some constructive um, comments, I think that would go a long way. Uh, I don't know exactly how you do it, but I just don't think that it, it can really meet a... Uh, it's hard if the nuclear option is your only option. So. Pardon me? It's hard if the nuclear option is your only option, which is to just say no. I understand. I just don't think it, it can be said to be, uh, the petitioner could be acting with due diligence under these circumstances. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Schutz, CSPA. Good afternoon, Chris Schutz with the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. Um, here on behalf of Bill Jennings, who couldn't be here today, uh, Bill has a speech. I'm going to read some excerpts, and I've okay. given copies to uh, yeah. Carol and, and for each of you. Um, since the last, since the 70s at least, the State Board's first response to drought has been to ignore or waive water quality standards and flow standards established through evidentiary proceedings. These standards already incorporate relaxed requirements applicable in critically dry year situations as several of the previous speakers have noted and given more graphic representation. In the 30 odd years that CSPA has been involved in board proceedings, we're unable to identify a single instance where the board has taken an enforcement action against the projects for the thousands of times they violated basin plan requirements. In the 1989 to 91 period, the board said it wouldn't take an enforcement action for some 246 violations. Mm. It, set, it sent similar letters um, in 2009 and 2013. To be accurate, the board did issue a 2006 cease and desist order against the projects for violations of the South Delta salinity standards. The order required the projects to inform the board what they were going to do to avoid violations. Since 2007 through last December, South De Delta salinity standards have been violated a total of 858 days. The board has arbitrarily weakened critical year standards to establish, uh, establish to protect fisheries and water quality eight times in the past 91 days or once every 11 days on average. It has done so but in a closed door backroom process that by design excludes the public. It has failed to respond to protests or schedule formal hearings as required by law. Informal workshops are not acceptable surrogates for formal evidentiary proceedings nor has the board acknowledged or complied with the federal Delta water quality standards at 40 CFR 131.37 since they were adopted in 1995. The pattern and practice of waiving promulgated regulations and standards uh, and due process makes a mockery of law and subverts public involvement. These serial violations of Bay Delta standards cover the failure to enforce establishes that promises, guarantees, assurances, or even standards protecting the estuary are, in Bill's words, not worth the paper they're written on. This reality equally applies to contemplated assurances in BDCP or the adaptive manages, management provisions that are contemplated in the board's ongoing Delta plan update. Hmm. If, if standards don't mean anything, then what does adaptive management mean in that context? Reducing outflow below critical year standards, relaxing salinity standards, and export-import ratio inflow ratios will have a devastating impact on listed species already suffering from decades of chronic violations and mismanagement. Decreased outflow will draw the low salinity zone upstream, reduce critical habitat for long fin and delta smelt, subject smelt to increased entrainment and lethal water temperatures, impair food chain production, lower turbidity and increased predation, 
reduce migration cues for salmon and steelhead and vastly expand the range of invasive non-native clams and noxious weeds. The potential impacts to San Francisco Bay from low inflows, not seen for many decades, may be catastrophic, similar to the, what happened in the 1987 to 1992 drought when we had population crashes and regime shifts in the estuary that will likely last, that will last, that have lasted for decades and that may be permanent. Uh, I think Doug discussed some of those issues mm -hmm. in terms of um, what's happened with invasive species and in terms of some of the population crashes we saw during that period. Moving salinity compliance from Amiston, Amiton to Three Mile Zoo, uh, th Three Mile Slough, excuse me, um, will will vastly increase salinity throughout the delta and adversely impact delta agriculture and other legal users of water, allowing one-to-one -one export of water transfers and San Joaquin pulse flow, river pulse flows, along with a shift of exports to the Tracy pumping plant will severely reduce survival of San Joaquin salmon and steelhead by eliminating their freshwater migration corridor through the delta from April through June. And the potential installation of North Delta barriers, though that's on the shelf at the moment, will lead to reduced outflow and a reduction in freshwater inflow and net transport to the critical cash slew smelt habitats in the North Delta. Additional water transfers above and beyond 1,500 CFS export limit will exacerbate many of the adverse impacts identified above. The amount of water saved in storage from lax relaxation of standards will, by the time where all is said and done, likely be less than the amount of water exported. Exports are conditioned on compliance with D1650, D1641, reducing exports to levels for health and safety this year would allow standards to be met and provide additional upstream storage in case the drought continues. CSPA and C1 will be submitting a protest of the latest version 8 of the board's May 2nd 2014 temporary urgency change and a paragraph by paragraph rebuttal of the effects analysis that accompanied the project's latest petition to extend and modify the order. The board is a steward of public trust resources. The estuaries, anadromous and pelagic fisheries and native lower tropic, trophic food web have declined by one to two orders of magnitude since the state water project began exporting water in 1967. By any conceivable yardstick or grading system, the board has earned an F in protecting public res trust resources. The Delta and citizens of California deserve better. Respectfully submitted, Bill Jennings. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Do you have anything you want to add on your own? I think a lot of the issues that were um, that I would seek to address were addressed by uh, South Delta and by Doug in terms of the process. Mm -hmm. I think we started this way too late. I think we need to start whatever we're going to do now um, as soon as possible. I think there needs to be more formal input. Um, and the idea that we can sort of do this by the seat of the pants and, mm -hmm. and uh, exclude uh, thoughtful and knowledgeable public participation is just really one of the most egregious parts of what's happened over the last se uh, four months. Um, I, I, it started when, instead of anticipating that the cliff was coming, we waited till we were at the edge of the cliff, and um, then all of a sudden said, gee, um, we really have a problem, um, we might fall. Thanks. Uh, Kim Delfino, Defenders of Wildlife and the Central Valley Joint Venture. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. I um, appreciate the fact that you are having public comment. Um, and I'm here to just uh, actually talk about one specific issue. Um, I'm here to discuss refuge water supply. Uh, because, you know, I understand all of the various interests that the board and the state water project operators and the Central Valley Water Project operators have to deal with. But it seems that as we've been going through these issues, the issues of what happens to the refuges has been sort of uh, treated in a more secondhand manner. Like, we'll get to that issue. 
Um, it sounds like uh, now that we've raised this issue uh, several times, and in fact just sent a letter late last night mm -hmm. to you and other um, officials with the federal and state agencies, that more attention is being paid to this matter. But I just want to remind the board that the, the federal, uh, the 19 federal wildlife refuges and wildlife areas that are out there are basically the backbone of what's left of our, wild, our, of our Central Valley wetlands. Um, it essentially represents 5% of what was originally wetlands in the Central Valley. It is, it is a, just a mere remnant. Um, and providing water in sufficient amounts to these refuges is absolutely critical. Um, I heard folks talk about, you know, well, some people are getting 100% and 75%. When I talk about 75% to the wildlife refuges under the, as required under the Central Valley Project Improvement Act, that is a bare minimum because, as many of you already know, when the Central Valley Project Improvement Act was passed, the wildlife refuges were allocated a minimum amount of water called level two water supply. That was the bare minimum of what they needed to make up for the years of n not having sufficient water. Then there was another increment on top of that called level four water supply, which is sort of helping the refuges get better, which we've never been able to achieve. The CVPIA mandates that the wildlife refuges shall not receive any less than 75% of that minimum level two water supply. And the, the reason why I'm up here today is there is concern that decisions are being made through the board's orders, through allocations, and through, the, and through then reconciling it with the coordinated operating agreement for the Central Valley Project and State Water Project, that we're setting up a situation in which the water, with wildlife refuges, particularly the south of, wildlife, south of Delta wildlife refuges, because the north of Delta refuges are getting a 75% allocation. The south of Delta refuges are not going to be able to meet that 75% allocation. And I'm here today just to simply remind you, as you're going through and making your orders and weighing all of the interests, that there's communication going on between you, the, the uh, Department of Water Resources, Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Bureau of Reclamation and the Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, to ensure that the end result is that the Bureau will be able to meet its CVPIA mandate mm -hmm. of providing 75 percent of water supply, of level two water supply to the refuges. I appreciate that the, um, I believe the board, the Bureau was able, testified this morning, I wasn't here this morning, but, mm -hmm. and said that they're working very hard to reach that, but it, they're not there yet. And we want to make sure that they are able to get there and that decisions that are being made by other bodies don't make it impossible for them to reach that. Uh, requirement. Again, it's not asking for a huge amount of water for the refuges. This is a really small amount of water, but it is an absolutely critical amount of water. And when you think about the fact that there will be, that this amount of water is the only, with the drought out there, there will be a lot less wet areas. If you're a bird flying from Mexico to, uh, to Canada and back again, the amount of water that's on the ground will be very little once you hit south. And uh, the refuges are really the last place for these birds to stop over. And we will see impacts uh, from this. Mm -hmm. And we understand that there will be impacts, but we have to have that minimum refuge uh, water supply, that level two water supply. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Russ Brown from Daily Data Analysis Methods. Uh, we're going to try this on the screen. My name is Russ Brown. I work for ICF International. And on today's um, presentation, though, I'm just presenting some methods, a method in particular that I'm wanting to suggest to us collectively that we could use. And it'll 